All right, chapters eight and nine. We'll see if the teaching a tea and to read continues. By the next morning, he was half sorry the boy would not be coming again. He didn't know whether he was annoyed or relieved when Tian walked through the door without a sign of greeting and sat down at the table. Matt decided to skip B for bone. In the night, he had thought of a better way. This book isn't a treaty, he began. It's a story. It's about a man who gets shipwrecked on a desert island. I'll read some of it out loud to you. He opened Robinson Crusoe at the first page and began to read. I was born in the year 1632 in the city of York. He stopped. He remembered suddenly how the first time he had tried to read the book, he had found that the first page was so dull he had come close to giving up right there. He had better skip, in the, be skip the beginning and get on with the story if he wanted to catch Etienne's attention. I'll read the part about the storm at sea, he said. He had read the book so many times that he knew exactly where to find the right page. Taking a deep breath, as though he were struggling in the water himself, he chose the page where Robinson Crusoe was dashed from the lifeboat and swallowed up in the sea. This is an excerpt from the book. Nothing could describe the confusion of thought which I felt when I sunk into the water, for though I swam very well, yet I could not deliver myself from the waves so as to draw breath, for I saw the sea come after me as high as a great hill and as furious as an enemy. Matt looked up from the page. There was not a flicker of interest in the boy's face. Had he understood a single word? Discouraged, Matt laid down the book. What did a storm at sea mean to a savage who had lived all of his life in the forest? Well, he said kind of lamely, it gets better as you go along. Once more, Etienne took him by surprise. White man get out of water? he asked. Oh, yes, Matt said, delighted. Everyone else on the ship is drowned. He gets thrown up all alone on an island. The Indian nodded. He seemed satisfied. Shall I read more of it? Etienne nodded. Go now, he said. Come back, Siba. The next morning, there was no question of B for bone. Matt had the book open and waiting at the part he wanted to read. This is about the morning after the storm, he explained. Robinson Crusoe looks out and sees that part of the ship hasn't sunk yet. He swims out and manages to save some things and carry them to the shore. And he began to read. Once again, it was impossible to tell whether Etienne understood. Presently, Matt slowed down. It was discouraging reading to a wooden post, but Etienne spoke at once. White man not smart like Indian, he said scornfully. Indian not need thing from ship. Indian make all thing he need. Disappointed and cross, Matt put the book down. They might as well get on with the alphabet, and he drew a B on the birch bark. After Etienne had gone, Matt kept thinking about Robinson Crusoe and all the useful things he had managed to salvage from the ship. He had found a carpenter's chest, for instance, bags of nails, two barrels of bullets, and a dozen hatchets. A dozen! Why, Matt and his father had come up here to Maine with one axe. They had cut down trees and built this whole cabin and the table and the stools without a single nail. Caruso had found a hammock to sleep in instead of prickly hemlock boughs. He could see now it must have, how it must have sounded to Etienne. Come to think of it? Robinson Crusoe had lived like a king on that desert island. A few mornings later, at the end of the lesson, Matt delayed Etienne. How did you kill that rabbit? He asked, pointing to the offering Etienne had thrown on the table. There's no bullet hole in it. Indian not use bullet for rabbit, Etienne answered scornfully. Then how? There's no hole at all. For a moment, it seemed that Etienne would not bother to answer. Then the Indian shrugged. A tea and show. Come, he said. Matt was dumbfounded. It was the first sign the Indian had given of, well, of what exactly? He had not sounded friendly. But there was not time to puzzle this out right now. A tea and was walking across the clearing, and he apparently expected Matt to follow. Pleased and curious, Matt hobbled after him, grateful that he no longer needed the crutch. At the edge of the clearing, the Indian stopped and searched the ground. Presently, he stooped down under a black spruce, poked in the dirt, and jerked up a long snake-like root. He drew from the leather pouch at his belt a curious sort of knife. The blaze blade curved into a hook. With one sure stroke, he split one end of the root, then peeled off the bark by pulling it at, with his teeth. 
he separated the whole long length into two strands, which he spliced together by rolling them against his bare thigh. Next, he searched around about in the bushes till he found two forked saplings about three feet apart. He trimmed the twigs from these, drawing his knife toward his chest, as Matt had been taught not to do. Then he cut a branch and rested it lightly across the forks of his saplings. From the thread-like root, he made a noose and suspended it from the stick so that it hung just above the ground. He worked without speaking, and it seemed to Matt that all this took him no more time at all. Rabbit run into trap, he said finally. Pull stick into bush so white boy can kill. Golly, said Matt, filled with admiration. I hadn't thought of making a snare. I didn't know how you could make one without string or wire. Make more, Etienne ordered, pointing in the woods, not too close. After Etienne had gone, Matt managed to make two more snares. They were clumsy things, and he was not too proud of them. Splitting a slippery root, he discovered, was not as easy as it had looked. He spoiled a number of them before he mastered the trick of splicing them together. They did not slide as easily as the one Etienne had made, but they seemed strong enough. The next morning, he showed his traps to Etienne. He had hoped for some sign of approval, but all he got was a grunt and a shrug. He knew that to Etienne his work must look childish. However, on the third day, one of his own snares had been upset, though the animal had gotten away. The day after that, to his joy, there was actually a partridge struggling to free itself in the bushes where the stick had caught. This time, the grunt with which Etienne rewarded him sounded very much like his grandfather's good. Silently, the Indian watched as Matt reset the snare. Then they walked back to the cabin, Matt swinging his catch as nonchalantly as he had seen Etienne do. You don't need to bring me any more food, he boasted. I'll catch my own meat from now on. Nevertheless, Etienne continued to bring him some offering every morning. Not always fresh meat. He seemed to know exactly when Matt had finished the last scrap of rabbit or duck. Sometimes he brought a slab of corn cake or a pouch full of nuts, once a small cake of maple sugar. Plainly, he felt bound to keep the terms of his grandfather's treaty. Matt stuck to his part of the bargain as well, though the lessons were an ordeal for both of them. Matt knew well enough what a poor teacher he was. Sometimes it seemed that Etienne had le was learning in spite of him. Once the Indian had resigned himself to mastering 26 letters, he took them in a gulp, scorning the childish candle and door and table that Matt had devised. Soon he was spelling out simple words. The real trouble was that Etienne was contemptuous, that the whole matter of white man's words seemed to him nonsense. Impatiently, they hurried through the lessons to get on with Robinson Crusoe. Matt suspected that the only reason Etienne agreed to come back day after day was that he wanted to hear more of that story. Skipping over the pages that sounded like sermons, Matt chose the sections that he liked best himself. Now he came to the rescue of the man Friday. Etienne sat quietly and Matt almost forgot him in his own enjoyment of his favorite scene. There was a mysterious footprint on the sand, the canoes drawn up on the lonely beach, and the strange, wild-looking men with two captives. One, was, one of the captives was mercilessly slaughtered. The fire was set blazing for a cannibal feast. Then the second captive made a desperate escape, running straight to where Caruso stood watching. Two savages pursued him with horrid yells. Matt glanced up from the book and saw that Etienne's eyes were gleaming. He hurried on. No need to skip here. Caruso struck a mighty blow at the first cannibal, knocking him senseless. Then, seeing that the other was fitting an arrow into his bow, he shot and killed him. Matt continued to read on. The poor savage who fled, but had stopped, though he saw both his enemies had fallen, yet was so frightened with his noise and fire of my peace that he stood stock still and neither came forward nor went backward. I hallooed again to him, and he made signs to him to come forward, which he easily understood, and came a little way and then stopped again. He stood trembling as if he had been taken prisoner and just been and just been to be killed as his two enemies were. I beckoned to him again to come to me and gave him all signs of encouragement that I could think of, and he came nearer and nearer, kneeling down every ten or twelve steps in token of acknowledgment for saving his life. I smiled at him and looked pleasantly and beckoned to him to come still nearer. At length he came close to me, and then he kneeled down again, kissed the ground, and taking my foot, set it upon his head. This, it seemed, was a token of swearing to be my slave forever. 
Remember, some of those sections are actually from the book Robinson Crusoe as we read them, as he's reading them to Etienne. Etienne sprang to his feet, a thundercloud wiping out all pleasure on his face. Not so, he shouted. Matt stopped, bewildered. Him never do that. Never do what? Kneel down to white man. But Caruso had saved his life. Not kneel down, Etienne repeated fiercely. Not to be slave, better to die. Matt opened his mouth to protest, but Etienne gave him no chance. In three steps, he was out of the cabin. Now he'll never come back, Matt thought. He sat slowly, turning over the pages. He had never questioned that story. Like Robinson Crusoe, he had thought it was natural and right that the wild man should be the white man's slave. Was there perhaps another possibility? The thought was new and troubling. End of chapter 9. So that was chapter 8 and 9. So do you think Etienne is going to come back? Do you understand why he was so upset with Robinson Crusoe that there is this man who saved another man's life? Should he be his slave? Do you understand why Etienne was upset? So just some things to think about. I hope at this point you're kind of enjoying the book. Um, there's some pretty exciting things that happen. Um, think about the relationship between Etienne and Matt. Um, and we'll continue reading.